Okay, uh, so let's start this exciting webinar today. Thank you all for joining us. Um, my name is Renuka Badhe and I'm the Executive Secretary of the European Polar Board and it is my utmost pleasure to welcome you to this webinar today. Just for information, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the European Polar Board's YouTube channel. The microphones and the cameras of the audience are automatically switched off. Uh, if you're having any trouble at all, technical, technical trouble regarding Zoom uh, or any such thing, you can use the chat box and ask for assistance. Uh, some support is also available on the Zoom website uh, support pages and uh, my colleague Piotr will just paste a link for that in the chat box. The full program for today's webinar is available on the European Polar Board website and a link for that will also be available on the chat. Any questions that you might have, uh, particularly for our speakers, um, I request that you type those directly into the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of the screen on the Zoom window. That's the easiest for all the speakers when they um, to see the question and answers and they can respond to these questions as the webinar is going on. We will also have a short Q&A at the end of the session where these questions will be addressed. If you'd like a specific questions, uh, if, you, if you'd like to ask speakers specific questions, um, then you can tag them in the Q&A box and the speakers can also take a chance to answer them during the webinar itself if they so wish. So what is today's webinar about? Since being initiated in 2016, the ASM or the Arctic Science Ministerial process uh, have provided a key high-level coordinating platform for global research in the Arctic. We are now approaching in May, the third Arctic Science Ministerial, which is co-organized by the governments of Iceland and Japan. The last year has also been quite influential with many high-level developments within the European polar research community, such as the development of the new EU Arctic policy, the release of the European polar research program, the start of EU polar net two and the EU polar cluster, as well as the ESA polar science cluster. This webinar thus aims to explore particularly a European perspective on the ASM process and we hope to underline many exciting developments since ASM2 and hope to contribute to the ASM3. The webinar will further explore how existing structures and entities for coordination of polar research in Europe can help to facilitate the activities of working towards the aim of the ASM process, thus nurturing a strong and cohesive European community for Arctic research. Today we have speakers from a range of European entities that are working to coordinate different aspects of Arctic science and research. And we will all discuss how these initiatives align with the SM process in the core, core context of the four SM3 themes of observe, understand, respond, and strengthen. Our speakers today are, we have Lindsay Arthur from the ASM3 organizing committee who works, in, works with the Icelandic Ministry of Education, Science and Culture. We have Anna Maria Stan, who will speak on the EU Arctic policy uh, and research and innovation. And she comes from the EU Arctic policy and research and innovation uh, department. The uh, Euro integrated European polar research program will be next. And this will be presented by Marina Luce from CNRS. We will then have Nicole Bibo from the Alfred Wegener Institute who will speak to us about coordinating and co-designing the European research area with EU Polar Net 2 and EU Polar Cluster. Nicole will be followed by Jerome Buffard from the European Space Agency who will introduce us to the ESA Polar Science Cluster who will then be followed by Kirsi Latola, who is the chair of the EPB and is also with the University of Oulu. And she will introduce us to the European Polar Board and 25 years of coordination of polar research. 
After all these amazing talks, we will have a short group discussion and a Q&A session. So Lindsay, take it forward. Thank you. Thanks so much, Renuka. And thanks so much um, to the European Polar Board for organizing this discussion and inviting the ASM3 organizing committee to sort of give a brief presentation to kind of contextualize things um, at the beginning of this. Um, so this isn't too long, but just sort of to kind of introduce how the ASM3 science process um, was set up and, you know, I think then we'll get into discussion about how Europe specifically kind of works into that process. So as Renuka said, the third Arctic Science Ministerial is co-hosted by Iceland and Japan. The first ASM took place um, in Washington DC in 2016, and that was hosted by the United States. Um, and then sort of following the chairmanship of the Arctic Council, which then went on to Finland, um, the second ASM was a joint affair between Finland and um, the European Commission and Germany. And so Japan and Iceland sort of took this same context of an Arctic and non-Arctic state uh, working together to host the next ASM. And um, that's been a really beneficial process. I think um, Japan is, you know, a well-known player in the Arctic research landscape and they've been um, invested in Arctic research for many decades. Um, and so this process of working together um, and working on this huge project has been really beneficial and I think been a big learning experience for both of us. So we sort of took um, what we understood from the previous ASMs and then thought about, you know, how can we kind of um, expand the work that's done previously and especially looking back at the themes from ASM1 into ASM2. So you can go on to the next slide. Um, we took kind of similar themes um, from ASM2, but then we added in back that fourth theme, which was uh, sort of expressed in the first ASM, bringing a particular focus um, to education and capacity building in education. Um, and so adding that, and we really looked at the themes for this ASM as this four-step iterative cycle um, that all influence each other. So although observe comes first, um, you know, easily strengthen could come first. And so we looked that, you know, all of these things kind of influence each other and we needed to take a more holistic um, approach to how we think about these themes how they relate to each other, and then thinking as a whole um, of knowledge for a sustainable Arctic. So understanding how science in sort of the Western framework, um, but as well as indigenous and traditional knowledge play into our understanding of what is happening in the Arctic, and then how we come together um, sort of in that international context for cooperation um, towards achieving objectives um, and, and kind of moving the ball forward within these themes. So you can go on to the next slide. So this is kind of a glance at the participants um, for this next ASM. So we have um, invited um, some new countries to participate in this process. Um, Austria and Belgium notably, uh, I think we're kind of involved um, in the beginning of the process uh, for ASM2, um, but then ultimately didn't participate in the ministerial. And so that's an adjustment. And then we've also invited um, Thailand and Malaysia um, in Asia to be involved in the process. Um, this ASM is actually the first ministerial level Arctic meeting to take place in Asia. Um, so it's, a really significant deal that Japan is hosting this meeting and, you know, potentially involving more um, Asian partners who are engaged uh, in the ASM discussion to be part of this framework. And then, of course, um, we have the six Arctic Indigenous um, organizations who are represented in the Arctic Council um, are also invited to take part in the ASM process. 
and contribute and invited to the ministerial as well as um, help to develop the joint statement. And then for ASM3, we have 16 international organizations that are focused on science and education in the Arctic. So for ASM2, I believe it was 10 um, international organizations. So we have expanded that most significantly by inviting the working groups of the Arctic Council to contribute um, science projects related to the ASM themes to this ASM. Um, I think as everyone knows, the working groups of the Arctic Council do significant um, research and scientific contributions to what is happening in the international research landscape in the Arctic. So including them in this process really made sense um, and I think works to sort of build a bridge between the science that's happening in the Arctic Council and the ASM. Because of course, you know, the ASM supports kind of the science-driven work of the Arctic Council in that way. Okay, moving on to the next slide. So for the ASM, we developed a science advisory board, and this is also how we get um, kind of some of the, the key international um, Arctic science organizations engaged in this process. So we wanted um, an inclusive and balanced and representative board um, with representation from these different organizations to help us kind of develop the scientific questioning um, of the ASM process and then help us to review all of the science that is submitted, which is a huge job. <laughs> um, and our science advisory board was just absolutely essential and instrumental in helping us review um, all of those projects. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. And so this is just kind of a glance at what that science process is. So we wanted a really comprehensive look at all of the science that was contributed through the ASM process. Um, sort of continuing from what was done previously, we asked for Arctic research overviews, um, as well as projects on submitted, projects, updates on projects submitted um, to the previous ASM and then new projects that are sort of in support of the ASM3 themes. Um, so that's kind of what was all done before in terms of what we request from countries and organizations. Um, and so those are the indigenous organizations as well as the international science and education organizations, um, what they contribute to the ASM. Um, we tried to formalize this a bit more by really making some clear forms where we're asking really specific questions um, and trying to kind of unify uh, the responses that we get so that we can do more with the data. Um, and then we also added a survey that was on collaboration and cooperation in Arctic research so that we could ask really specific questions about how people already cooperate, what the gaps and barriers are that they see to that cooperation. Um, and then also what opportunities they see lying ahead so that we could get just a more comprehensive view um, from everyone. So um, we've also, you know, that's really kind of specifically for the um, countries and organizations, but we also wanted to be in touch with just the wider um, Arctic research community around the world. Um, so we developed a lot of opportunities, which, changed because of COVID, but I think we really tried to make up those opportunities. Um, what we had originally envisioned is, is that there would be these kind of open ASM3 um, meetings that happened both at ASSW um, in Iceland last year, at ISAR6 in Japan, um, of course through the AOS process, and then also through ICAS10 in Russia. So all of those meetings were moved online. So we kind of moved our um, kind of community workshops online as well. Um, and those were really well attended. Uh, we got a lot of feedback and a lot of really good discussions. And so again, we kind of created these um, summaries to kind of take all of that information that could then feed into our science process, be reviewed by the Science Advisory Board um, and then kind of integrated into the final uh, ASM3 science summary, which we use to support the science in the joint statement for the ASM. So the next slide, please. 
Um, this is just sort of the same information uh, <laughs> presented in a different visualization to sort of show how all of that information comes through. And you can go on to the next slide. Um, we're really happy to see so much science was submitted through the ASM process. Um, so we have uh, a lot of projects submitted. So again, that was a lot of work for our science advisory board um, to kind of sift through and sort through. So this is just kind of a glimpse of how projects have developed um, over time from one ASM to the next. And the next slide. Yeah, so this is just kind of a look at, you know, where we take all of this science from this really wide ranging um, science consultation process and then what it results in. So, of course, um, we have the joint statement, which is from all of the countries and the European Union sort of collaborating um, on their kind of joint vision and um, joint cooperations moving forward based on all of the science that was submitted. Then we have this final uh, ASM3 report, which includes the science summary, um, as well as other kind of final outcomes from this whole process. Um, we're very happy that we've developed a lot of online resources from this ASM3 process. Most importantly, or significantly for this group, um, this webinar series that we um, did in partnership with the European Polar Board. And so not only did we have some workshops, um, in 2020 through this webinar series to actually provide input into the science process, um, but then also sharing all of the, or many of the significant science projects um, on each of the themes. Um, and we're really happy and proud of that series um, and hope that this is something that goes forward in future ASMs because it's a wonderful way to share in a free and open public platform um, all of the the research and discussions on the ASM3 science or on the ASM science process. Um, we've also developed these uh, sort of list of international opportunities and resources based on that survey that all of the countries um, gave back to us that uh, will be shared on the ASM3 website. We have the Arctic research overviews from all the countries and organizations. And then we're also developing for the first time a project database. Um, so this is actually mapping all of the projects submitted through the ASM3 process that can be available um, online and searchable on a map. And then of course, we have the third Arctic Science Ministerial, which is to take place um, very soon <laughs> uh, in Japan. So we're looking forward to that. So the next slide is just sort of a look at, you know, what the webinar series was. We have one final webinar um, in June that's kind of looking back at the ministerial and, and what happened and what we see going forward. So I think then the last slide is just a thank you. And I see the comments too here from Vijay that uh, India's name was missing from the list. So thank you for noting that. Uh, we will make sure that India's name is not missing from any of the official lists. So thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And it was as much a pleasure from the EPB to support the ASM webinars as well. I think it was a good collaborative uh, opportunity. So our next speaker is Anna Maria Stan. Um, I invite you to take the, take the screen. Yes, uh, thank you, Renuka. <clears throat> and good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Anna Maria Stan and I work in the DG Research and Innovation of the European Commission in the unit dealing with healthy oceans and um, where we, uh, I'm in charge of uh, polar research and uh, following the Arctic policy. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me in this uh, conversation and the, very important to discuss the European um, perspectives for the, the Arctic Science Ministerial. Uh, Lindsay get, gave a very comprehensive overview, so I'd just like to add um, from the European Commission perspective that, um, as you've seen, in the, the Commission was in the list of uh, countries and governments, al although the, the Union is, is neither a country nor a government, but uh, uh, we are probably the, the only international organization that has a more pronounced supranational status that allows us to be in the signatories of such a, 
a, um, such a process. And this is because research is a shared competence between the, the union and uh, its member states. So the commission can participate along the, the countries. Out of the 27 countries, there are 13 uh, member states of the Union and then uh, four associated countries. Uh, Norway and Iceland are in the European Economic Agreement, so they participate very fully in the research programs of the Union. And UK and Switzerland are also associated countries, but there the details are not... Uh, the, uh, I, I mean, uh, it's still under a negotiation. Um, the Commission has participated in the Arctic Science Ministerial since the beginning in 2016. Um, in uh, 2018, it has actually co-organized the Arctic Science Ministerial together with Germany and Finland. And our um, Commissioner Maria Gabriel, she will take part in the next Science Ministerial in Tokyo and she would sign the joint statement on behalf of the Union. Um, can I can I pass to the next slide, please? Uh, so, what does this mean that the Commission is is participating and signing the joint statement? This shows, of course, the interest and commitment to support Arctic research. Um, and the uh, I can say that the Arctic is is high on the agenda of the the new Commission of Ursula von der Leyen. Um, the Union has had a policy on the Arctic since around 2008. The last policy um, document is from 2016. And I'll quickly recall the objectives, uh, which are still actual. It's climate change and safeguarding the environment. It's sustainable in development in and around the Arctic and the international cooperation in the Arctic. And research plays a key role um, across all these priorities. This policy is to be updated this year and, um, and a public consultation has been open uh, last year where um, we've seen that the, the three priorities are of course still very pertinent so they'll probably stay the same. Uh, I cannot say more, I mean, I cannot say anything now on the content of this communication, but it's, uh, it's adoption, it's planned for October this year. And uh, it's part of the strong, a Stronger Europe in the World Commission priority. Together with the launch of the communication, there will be the Arctic Stakeholders Forum in November. Uh, and it will be accompanied by a half a day of dialogue with Arctic Indigenous peoples. So let's say that in the second half of the year, we'll have several events where the Arctic will be prominently featured and, and research will have uh, an important role to play. Um, I already said that this, the policy contributes to the stronger Europe in the world priority, but also, of course, to the new European Green Deal. As I'm sure you all know that climate change and environmental degradation are uh, more prominent on the Commission agenda. We have the, the Green Deal, which aims to make Europe a um, neutral, uh, so no net emissions of greenhouse gases by 2050. And of course, polar research is key here for both um, understanding the changes that are happening in the Arctic and also exploring ways to respond and uh, building capacity for the new generations. I took the, the themes from the, um, this year's ministerial. Uh, can I have the, the next slide, please? So the main instrument that uh, the Commission has to support polar research is, of course, the program. Uh, until uh, last year, we had the Horizon 2020. And we support both uh, research, but also creating a polar research community uh, through EU PolarNet and EU Polar Cluster. Um, that I, uh, and um, the EU Polar, the European Polar Board is, is part of EU PolarNet, so the organizers of today's sessions are very much involved in this um, European Polar Communities that is, is supported by Horizon 2020, and. Um, 
we also the commission has its own research center i just wanted to mention the grc which is producing their own studies participates in projects and also represents the commission in expert groups and working groups in the arctic council and not to forget copernicus uh, the eu's um earth observation program i mean not uh, and which has a very a key role to play in uh, in arctic research um about international cooperation i wanted just to signal that the last arctic science ministerial has created the arctic science funders forum and uh, this group has become active quite recently a couple of months ago it has its first meeting and it's about the need to further an align and coordinate funding for uh, research priorities for the Arctic. The Commission will take part on this as, as being uh, an Arctic research funder through the Horizon programs. Um, and uh, regarding science diplomacy, another tool that we have uh, to support Arctic research is also the All Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance, where we have a research cooperation with partners both in the North Atlantic and in the South Atlantic. Of course, what the uh, Arctic is pertinent with, with the cooperation we have built there with the US and Canada. Uh, but also the South Atlantic countries are important for research in Antarctica. And um, we aim to extend those uh, discussions and cooperation to both poles. Mm, and maybe I could last mention that uh, the Commission is also contributing to the UN Decade for Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Oh, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And. Um, out of our recent activities to support polar research, I wanted to highlight the cooperation we have with the European Space Agency. Uh, we have a, a more uh, bigger Earth uh, system science agreement and polar regions is one of the flagships of this initiative. But um, the first concrete event of this overall agreement was the European Polar Science Week organized in uh, October 2020. So it was the, the European Commission with the European Space Agency, but with uh, very important support from EU PolarNet. And uh, it was a first event of this kind, but uh, it's uh, first in a series, so we plan to organize more. And uh, it was very successful. It had over 1,000 participants from over 50 countries in the world. Uh, and uh, I think it's um, the cooperation with the space agency, it's, it's an important uh, part of our work. Can we pass this to the next slide? Thank you. And yeah, I would like to end with a few words on Horizon Europe. So this is the new program, as you know, it has just been adopted, well, it's been adopted recently, so I cannot say uh, details on the, the work programming because it's uh, it's too early, nothing has been adopted yet, but maybe to highlight some of the important features for polar research. Uh, a new feature of the program is um, the mission-oriented research. Already the polar research was under pillar two where it, we Support, the Commission supports, uh, sorry, the Union supports research with um, for societal challenges. And uh, the missions, they come to, to reinforce this. So they are partly inspired by Apollo 11. And uh, they intend to foster ambition and long-term research and innovation solutions to some of the most pressing challenges. Four of these missions will support the Green Deal. And two of these, namely the mission on healthy ocean and the one on climate adaptation are relevant for um, uh, the Arctic and uh, there will be an Arctic component probably through the missions as well for um, research. Um, another new feature of the new program is the European Innovation Council. So trying to take the research to, to providing concrete solutions uh, for society. And uh, I would like to mention two other tools that I think can contribute to, to enhancing um, Arctic research cooperation. One is the Marie Curie actions. 
which is support for researcher mobility, but it also has, for example, a pro, uh, program for innovative training networks, which support, supports joint research training or doctoral programs implemented by a consortium of partner of universities, research institutions, businesses, SMEs, and uh, I've already seen some on, on, our, on the Arctic, and I think it's a, it's a very interesting tool. And the other one, it's the COST, the European Cooperation in Science and Technology, which supports pan-European networks for the coordination of research activities. And this is the, the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank you for your time and your attention. And uh, I give it... Uh, Back to you, Renuka. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna Maria. Uh, super interesting. Keep your questions coming, everyone. We've got a couple of questions now, but we'll take them all in the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So yeah, please feel free to type out questions in the Q&A box. Our next speaker is Marino El Hussein, who will introduce us to the Integrated European Polar Research Program. Marino El, please. Thank you, Rinka, and thank you to the organizer for inviting me to this uh, meeting. So I will uh, try to present an overview of the European Polar Research Program, and uh, especially to explain how it was developed and how this uh, development process um, led to emergence of research priorities, which are uh, fully connected to the uh, ASN3 themes. So the Polar program was commissioned in the context of the EU PolarNet project. And the overall goal of this project was to develop the first, for the first time an integrated Polar research program that is co-designed with all relevant Polar stakeholders and international partners. And the objective of this program was to identify the knowledge gaps to be filled in order to answer the current needs and expectations of European societies and regarding the Polar regions. The Polar program is in fact the outcome of a five-year-long process which extended over the full duration of the EU Polarnet project. And the challenge was in fact to set up a, a, an inclusive approach in which the scientific expertise and the stake uh, or, and right order needs are considered all together to define uh, future Polar research priorities. The challenge, in fact, is a bit, um, is twofold. It was first to um, activate a, a methodology to set the dialogue with the stakeholders and uh, motivate their engagement. And uh, secondly, it was to uh, identify uh, uh, scientific expertise across uh, disciplines. Um, by essence, the, the Polar program, of course, had to be rooted in the existing uh, Polar international and national strategies. And so we started with a review of more, almost 150 publications of relevant strategies. And also, of course, it had to be in line with uh, global recommendations and guidelines like the Sustainable Development Goals of the, UN, of the United Nations especially with the aim, with the aim to uh, determine how polar research is relevant to these goals. So um, one of the key actions we uh, did to uh, meet the stakeholders and collect their need was, uh, for example, a public consultation which was, was launched in 2017. And this, uh, as an example, this uh, uh, consultation asked a single question to the stakeholders and right holders, what are the most important topics in relation to your work and everyday life in the polar region and that should be solved by future research. And in fact, they had to classify their needs in uh, five predefined thematic area. And we indeed received quite a lot of answers, more than 500 answers uh, arising from, uh, from uh, coming from 36 countries. And the major step of the program was, in fact, to examine this uh, corpus of stakeholder information and to uh, cluster the information into overarching themes. And that led us to uh, the construction of what we call the stakeholder document, which is summarized on the right here, 
is this uh, mind map, complicated one, where each branch is an overarching uh, thematic area and uh, the colors indicate the uh, information source. And then from this stakeholder document, we set up the structure of the, of the polar program and uh, had it drafted by a team of scientific experts. So the scientific experts had to extract, in fact, scientific questions which meet the societal needs. And in this exercise, I ended up with 28 key research questions distributed across six major research needs. Research in what? Sorry, research need one was a better understanding of climate change in the polar regions. Second one was informed weather and climate action. The third research need was resilient socio-ecological systems. Research need four was about prospering communities in the Arctic. Research need five was about challenges and opportunities in polar operations. And research need six was about inclusive creation, access, and usage of knowledge. So now I will try to give you a few examples of how the key research priorities that emerge in this program actually uh, meet the uh, four uh, recommendation themes of the Arctic Science Ministerial. If we first consider the observe theme, then the program really promotes enhanced uh, observation capacity and cooperation and improve data management and sharing. And more specifically, the program promotes enhanced, expanded and integrated observing systems, long-term multidisciplinary observation programs and observatories. It also promotes access to shared infrastructure around interdisciplinary and circumpolar collaborations advanced sensor and platform technologies and enhanced operational informatics, use of emerging remote sensing capabilities, and also access to fair data, use of existing data, best use of them, and increased connectivity through uh, data management regimes harmonized. If I now switch to the understand the theme, I think the program is really, by essence, identify inclusive and socially relevant research topics. And it, in particular, promotes co-production of knowledge to propose guidelines and participatory methods to the benefit of society. It also promotes understanding of key processes involving polar-specific components and their coupling and feedback. The assessment of the role of polar region at global scale, the role of the Arctic, especially in the global climate system. The assessment of the nature and amplitude of changes and vulnerabilities for through, in particular, improved modeling and prediction of the changes. Identifications of the impacts of human activities on environments and societies and also the understanding of the mechanisms that can sustain a healthy socio-ecological system, sustain improved well-being and quality of life in the polar regions. Uh, considering now the team respond, the program recognizes the importance of dedicating the research effort to a sustainable Arctic as a whole. So it is uh, in particular to develop increased collaboration between academia, indigenous organizations, local communities, governments, industries, to enhance technology, sustainable economies, and capacity building. The recommendation is also to develop relevant indicators of changes which are still missing, to develop ecosystem-based management, transformative solutions, and economic innovation toward a sustainable future, and finally, to exploit knowledge to inform decision making for the polar regions, including informed prediction of risk and hazards. The last team is Strengthen, and the polar, in this, that respect, the polar program recognizes the importance of research related to education, society awareness, and uh, engagement. First, it is to foster involvement of stake and right holders in the development and implementation of projects, to develop innovative education and training systems at all levels, ensuring integration of different knowledge sources, enhance capability building and networking to expand the capacity of Arctic residents and societies in general to respond to changes, 
and ensure knowledge access and transfers through assessment of communication tools and cooperation. So what does the European Polar Programme tell us about the future? Uh, the EU Polar Net, uh, the, the European Polar Programme certainly recognizes important challenges for the future of the Arctic. But at the same time, it recognizes weaknesses in the coordination of the present uh, Arctic research, polar research area. And in that respect, this, um, these weaknesses can uh, lead to severe limitation in the implementation of this program. So it is in fact the objectives of the follow-up of the EU Polar Net 1, EU Polar Net 2, to consider this aspect of coordination and co-designing co of the Euro new European polar research area. One of the particular objectives, one of the, of the many objectives of the EU Polar Net 2 is in particular to prioritize uh, the large thematic areas which have been identified in many documents and in particular in the polar program. And in that respect, the European polar program will certainly be a cornerstone to this prioritization. And finally, I should say also that uh, the European polar program is also probably a cornerstone to uh, meet the challenges that have been raised by the Arctic Science Ministerial. So thank you very much. I will leave you with this last slide, which lists uh, the full uh, uh, members and uh, groups which have participated and uh, which have been instrumental to the construction of the European Polar Program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marie Noel. That's uh, brilliant. We can now welcome our next speaker, Nicole Bibo, and she will introduce us to uh, EU Polar Net 2 and EU Polar Cluster, coordinating and co designing the European research area. Nicole. Um, thank you very much, Renuka. Do you properly see my screen? Yeah. Um, okay, then it should work. So um, I will introduce you now a bit more to Upolanet 2, which has been mentioned uh, beforehand already by Marino L and to the EU Polarnet, uh, to the EU Polar Cluster. Uh, both EU uh, Polarnet 2, but especially also the EU Polarnet Cluster are as Anna Maria mentioned before, major uh, contributions of the European uh, Union to the Arctic Science Ministerial process, uh, because of course, large part of the important research is done in the EU Polar Cluster projects. But let's start a bit uh, with EU Polar Net 2 so that you understand uh, what the project uh, will uh, be doing in the next four years. So we have just started in October last year um, and uh, we are a very large consortium of 25 European um, partners from all member states and associated countries with well-established polar programs in Europe. Uh, we also have international organizations as partner. The European Polar Board has been already mentioned, but we also have an indig indigenous partner from the International Center of Reindeer Husbandry, an industry partner from the World Ocean Council and an international organization, AMAP, um, are also members in our consortium. And the ambition of EU Polar Net 2 is uh, to uh, establish a sustainable and inclusive platform uh, to co-develop and advance European polar research actions. So, so this sounds very complicated, but in fact, what we're going to do is what um, Marino L also mentioned beforehand. The main goal of EU Polar Net 2 is we will use, uh, try to coordinate the European uh, community much better than we before on all levels and with stakeholders. So build on the expertise of EU Polar Net 1 and specify the polar research needs, which we have defined in the EPRP and in other documents so that they are applicable and implementable. Um, we also give advice to the policy making processes is another main goal in EU Polar Net. And at the end, we want to sustain this network and the platform in a European Polar Coordination Office, which then will work uh, permanently. In more detail, uh, I want to show you the objectives of EU Polar Net 2 uh, very quickly. So as I said before, um, 
one of the objectives is to advance European and international uh, cooperation in polar research. We have a work package and, a ta uh, and an objective on um, working with stake and right holders and providing strategies for meaningful engagement of them and also for capacity building. Our work package three and our objective three is the, uh, is the work package where we do the research prioritization already mentioned before. Then also interesting for the Arctic Science Ministerial process, we have an objective uh, in which we want to interact with the national uh, funding agencies and international ones like, for example, Belmont Forum um, to develop uh, synergies and optimize also the use of our resources. Uh, we have an objective on policy advice, as we said before. We have an objective which is related to implement uh, the sustained observing system in the Arctic and Antarctic. And as said before, of course, our final goal is to create a permanent European Polar Coordination Office. And if you look at the themes of the ASM, you see a clear relation. So our task on implementing the sustained observing system is certainly related to the observe theme. Understand theme is one of the main parts EU Polarnet 2 will deal with in the next four years via its research prioritization. We are also contributing to the theme strengthen and respond, uh, certainly through our uh, stakeholder and right holder engagement, but also across all other um, objectives and work packages. And as I said before, as I should specially mention, that uh, we already had discussions with the Icelandic organizers, how we uh, can join forces with the Arctic Science Funders Forum developed by ASM and our forum, or our group of national funding agencies, uh, which we will set up in EUPOLANET too. Um, sorry, um, if we go in the, yet now I somehow, yeah, made a mistake. This going on here. Um, so, okay. Um, if you look a bit more detail, um, how we contribute to the uh, different ASM themes. So, if you look at the observed theme, the role EU Polarnet 2 will play in the future in, in, in this area is that we would like to ensure um, a more unified European contribution to the whole polar observation uh, system. We would like also to support the acceleration um, of the development of the fully integrated observing system. And that's maybe our main contribution. We would like to mobilize all project partners, which are also representing all European nations to really contribute uh, to the different international uh, initiatives like SEON and SUS to give their input into the ongoing um, um, <clears throat> initiatives to coordinate the European community much better than it has been done before. Um, if we look at the second uh, theme, understand a bit more in detail, um, I think I should not say too much anymore on that. So. The main part of EU Polarnet will be to prioritize uh, themes from the EPRP, the European Polar Research Program, but also from our white papers and, of course, other important um, strategic documents, uh, and um, to, uh, to, to develop research um, projects, let's say, who can be really implemented by uh, normal third party funding. So, specify the very overarching research need defined in our strategy documents from EU Polarnet 1 to an applicable level. We will also try to uh, develop and identify large-scale initiatives of international interest. A good example is has been Mosaic. A good example will be, for example, the um, um, Arctic Survey here, the um, um, Synoptic Arctic Survey. Um, and um, maybe interesting for you listening here, we will also ask for your input uh, into this by um, asking for services, which will be funded as a kind of seed money. And uh, with these um, service contracts, how we call them, 
um, we have the possibility to ask the polar community in Europe to develop ideas from based on the EPRP further into an applicable mode. And this can be funded by EU Polarnet too. And finally, I, I said it before, we are also contributing to the uh, response and strengthen teams uh, via mainly our stakeholder engagement, but also the other work packages. Here, our intention is that we again on continue to co-develop and co-design uh, the research needs with all uh, stakeholders and right holders. And also we will develop better strategies for capacity building uh, together with polar stake and right holders uh, targeting early career uh, researchers, but also, for example, indigenous researchers. I spoke a lot about EU Polarnet, um, but now I will use the last few minutes to speak about the Polar Cluster. <clears throat> the Polar Cluster, um, so what we will do in EU Polarnet too, we will not do alone. Um, we will be, let's say, initiating the work, but then the prioritization and stakeholder engagement and so on will be done jointly with the EU Polar Cluster project. These are large-scale polar projects funded in Horizon 2020 and cu currently 21 projects and two um, international organizations like SIOS and the EPB have joined the cluster. And we have a range of projects. Some of them are polar projects targeting both poles, like for example, EU Polarnet. We have a vast range of Arctic projects. Um, I will uh, say if few more things about it in a minute and we also have dedicated Antarctic projects and this cluster project all target different scientific disciplines but by that contributing to the Arctic Science Ministerial process so they are investigating um, their investigations range from up-to-date findings on permafrost and sea ice from enhancing observation and improving predictions from understanding the terrestrial and the marine ecosystems change in the Arctic. We are also with a new cluster project supporting sustainable development. And in addition, I have to say, and the cluster is networking 79 research stations and six heavy icebreakers in the Arctic. So it's quite a capacity funded by the EU and a main contribution via the research through the Arctic Science Ministerial and also, uh, for example, um, contributing to the idea of sharing infrastructures. And the idea and the objectives of the cluster and also the reason why we implemented the cluster is that, of course, we would like to create synergies between the projects and by that maximize the impact and the visibility of European polar research. We want to pool resources to upscale effort we attempt to have a bigger knowledge sharing, um, also to maintain the legacy of uh, projects which ran out. And then finally, we have in to, uh, implemented in the cluster really active groups uh, who work on communication, stakeholder engagement, data management, education and policy advice across all the cluster project and um, um, uh, develop ideas how we could better cooperate in these, especially in these task group themes. That was my short overview. I thank you very much for your attention. And I would like to raise your attention to the first EU, EU Polarnet 2 for call for services. As I mentioned before, these are small seed money calls with which we ask you to contribute to our research prioritization process. The call for services will be advertised soon. So I guess in the next two or three, four weeks, you will see it on our website. So please look a bit on the EU Polarnet and the EU Polar Cluster website and follow our social media channels. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, we now have our next speaker who will introduce, uh, introduce the ESA Polar Science Cluster to us. Jerome, please. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. Yeah, it's all perfect. Thank you so much, Jerome. Perfect. So good morning, uh, everyone. My name is uh, Jerome Bouffard. Uh, I'm happy to be uh, here uh, this morning virtually and to make this presentation on behalf of my uh, ISA colleague. 
So this uh, presentation will uh, allow me to give a high level overview of uh, objectives, status and next step associated to the ESA Polar Science Cluster, especially within the perspective of the European uh, perspective on the Arctic uh, Science uh, Ministerial process. So the objective of uh, the ESA uh, Polar Science Cluster is to improve our observation uh, capacity over the polar region by capitalizing on uh, ESA and non-ESA uh, satellite mission. Then based on this uh, improved uh, observation capability, uh, the objective is to uh, increase, uh, to improve our scientific understanding of the different uh, processes and dynamic over the polar region from local and regional to global scales. Then based on this uh, scientific understanding and uh, knowledge, uh, the idea is to uh, translate it into concrete and actionable uh, solution for uh, society uh, via uh, decision making process, uh, integrating all this uh, scientific result. So to do so uh, at ISA, we are developing a, a wide range of, uh, of activity over the polar region, especially in the framework of uh, the ISA polar science cluster with a strong focus on developing novel uh, Earth observation product, method, and uh, multi-mission synergy and integration of all these Earth observation satellite mission together with uh, modeling and uh, ground-based observation. Uh, we should allow uh, to improve our understanding of uh, polar region and their role in Earth and climate system. Um, to do so, uh, we are uh, promoting, uh, promoting networking and collaborative uh, research, especially through the development of dedicated toolbox, uh, open science and virtual labs. Uh, we are also uh, pushing, developing education, training and mocks um, to achieve uh, this uh, goal of improving our understanding of polar region. We also rely on campaign and reference observation, which are used together with Earth observation mission. To do so, uh, we need to, uh, to uh, coordinate uh, with uh, international uh, partners uh, in order to, uh, to further enhance our knowledge over the polar region. So we are uh, addressing uh, different thematic area over the polar region, over the sea ice, land ice, ice cap and, uh, and glacier. Uh, with a wide range of, uh, of activity and project. So today we are running uh, more than 20 uh, projects and we are uh, already uh, preparing the future uh, through a dedicated invitation to, to Tender uh, that will be issued in the, in the coming months. Uh, we are developing several tools uh, such as uh, Cryosphere Virtual Lab and uh, we are also promoting uh, training activities and outreach uh, through uh, advanced course and mock uh, in the domain of, uh, of cryosphere sciences. Here I give only a few examples of the project uh, we, are, uh, we are implementing, especially based on, uh, on the cryosat mission. So here is an example over the Lamp Ice, the CryoSurf project, which aim at creating time series of penetration of uh, altimetric source uh, observation data into the snowpack by combining Cryosat with uh, the NASA uh, operational ice breed and ISAT2 in a multi-layer neural network. So the first results are very promising and they have been compared with a regional atmospheric model over the 10 years of, uh, of Cryosat data. Over the sea ice, uh, we are also uh, developing several projects. Uh, here again, two additional examples. Uh, one is the so-called Cryosat Plus Antarctic project. Uh, which aim at exploring uh, altimetric SAR processing method in order to generate uh, pan-Antarctic along track and gridded sea ice thickness, uh, in addition to ocean topography and uh, just of current, which are all uh, key geophysical variables interconnected and uh, particularly relevant to better understand the coupling between the cryosphere and ocean circulation. Over the Arctic, uh, we have kick out, kicked off very recently uh, the Polar Plus Snow on Sea Ice project, uh, which aim at developing and, and validating a, a new method on, based on multiband altimetry, KA, KU, and laser, as well as uh, in situ uh, and, and modeling techniques in order to retrieve a snow thickness over the Arctic sea ice. So most of the ESA uh, polar project uh, and campaign uh, are now designed and tuned in order to benefit to the so-called uh, cryo to ice uh, coincident orbit. 
So what is a Clio 2 ice? M mainly it is a, an international, it is a, the result of an international cooperation between uh, ESA and NASA, uh, consisting in changing uh, the orbit of the flying cryosat mission. So we have uh, recently raised uh, the semi-major axis of cryosat by about 900 meters in July 2020, in order to have a uh, collocating measurement between cryosat and ISAT-2, and therefore allowing to have for the first time radar and laser altimetric measurement over the polar region, and therefore improve uh, geophysical retrieval. So as I was saying, uh, most of the polar project we are managing will uh, benefit from this uh, collocated measurement over the pole, you can see on the animation on the right side, uh, difference of freeboard measurement from the two missions that are particularly uh, relevant and important in order to better understand the change in scattering horizon from laser and radar altimetry, which is instrumental to derive the snow depth, which is today the larger source of uh, error uh, in the retrieving uh, sea ice uh, signals from Earth observation. Uh, by having also this collocated measurement from these two missions uh, is also an asset to better uh, characterize and understand polar ocean and sea ice dynamics and is also uh, particularly useful to review the ice sheet mass balance record and improve uh, climatology. which is uh, particularly important in support to some international intercomparison project uh, we are developing. Uh, for example, the well-known INB project, the Ice Sheet Mass Balance Intercomparison Exercise, uh, which uh, is a project of about 10 years old, uh, consisting in a cooperation between scientists supported both by ESA and NASA in order to reconcile satellite measurement of uh, ice sheet mass balance. Uh, we are now preparing an equivalent project uh, in the frame of cooperation between uh, with a WMO, uh, allowing to, uh, to, to, to define and disseminate a community agreed assessment method, metric, and public domain protocol to evaluate and intercompare past, present, and future uh, sea ice sickness product, uh, both from Earth observation, but also uh, including ground based and airborne uh, observation. So to achieve all this goal, uh, international cooperation is, uh, is an asset. Uh, so especially uh, in, uh, in the frame of, uh, of, uh, of discussion and, uh, and cooperation between uh, ESA and uh, the European Commission. A collaboration agreement has been uh, recently signed between our two agencies with the common goal to jointly advance Earth system science and its contribution to respond to the global challenge that society is facing. In the frame of this uh, agreement, uh, the polar region uh, has a, is a central part, uh, a strong highlight uh, that will be a part of this, uh, of this cooperation. Because indeed, uh, we have to uh, see as a unique opportunity for Europe uh, to uh, benefit in the next decade of the most uh, comprehensive Earth system in the world, uh, especially over the, the polar region. And, Thanks uh, to the, um, especially thanks to, to the different program, including the, the Copernicus program. But of course, uh, to respond to this challenge, Earth observation alone uh, is not enough. That's why we have also to, uh, to rely on uh, in situ network, including fiducial reference measurement, which are particularly important in order to, uh, to derive uncertainty parameters from Earth observation. We have also to use all these in situ networks in addition to citizen data. We've, we wish uh, integrated uh, with uh, Earth observation mission to allow to enhance model and prediction over the polar region to address uh, pluridisciplinary uh, science challenge, uh, which will also benefit from new ICT, uh, new uh, processing method uh, uh, based on cloud computing and also by using new uh, artificial intelligence based method. So we have to, uh, to maintain and further reinforce uh, this international cooperation uh, across uh, different agencies in Europe, uh, including ESA and, uh, and European Commission, in order to, uh, to continue to join our force towards the common goal of improving our knowledge uh, for a sustainable uh, Arctic. Uh, we are, as previously mentioned, developing several projects which are uh, very complementary, both on the uh, EU, EU uh, polar cluster and on either side. 
So all this uh, project should allow to uh, further uh, enhance our um, capability to, uh, to observe and to understand the change over the polar region uh, by uh, promoting a sharing of knowledge, uh, tools, uh, data, uh, supporting scientific collaboration uh, with the objective to uh, further uh, enhance uh, our knowledge of, uh, of, uh, of the, the polar system and by uh, further increasing uh, the scope of, of scientific activity uh, and, and project to be implemented over the polar region. And with that, that's my last slide. Thank you very much, Jerome. Um, that was a wonderful introduction to the ESA Polar Science Cluster. Uh, I do encourage all the attendees to please use the Q&A box. To, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to type them out in the Q&A box. Now, our final speaker for the day is Kirsi Latola, who joins us from the Thule Institute uh, at the University of Olu, and she is also currently the chair of the European Polar Board. So, Kirsi, please. Thank you, Renuka. And good morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you are. I'm sitting in Finland, where I'm based, as, as Renuka already mentioned, at the University of Oulu. I also work for the University of the Arctic and chair the European Polar Board. And I will give you a very short introduction to European Polar Board, our past 25 years of coordination, but also cooperation within the polar research. And as mentioned, the EBP celebrated its 25th anniversary last year. It means that we were formed in 1995 as an advisory body to European Science Foundation. And since 2015, it has been an independent organization hosted in Netherlands by Dutch Research Council, NWO, in Den Haag. It also means that our secretariat, Renuka Joseph and others are sitting in Den Haag. The European Polar Board's mission is to promote, coordinate and advance European research in high latitudes. It means that we work in both poles, both in Arctic and in the Antarctic. And we promote the multilateral cooperation between our members and for our members. And we do that by providing a single contact point, which is our secretariat, which links together the members with each other and also to other organizations. Our members shared best practices, knowledge. They also work for shared infrastructures, how to improve the better access to, to each other's vessels and stations and so on, and also for the shared research and other activities. And data obviously is an important point as well. We have currently 28 members in 20 countries. And these members are the main, main polar actors in, within Europe. It means that our members host uh, 67 research stations, 20 vessels. For example, Polarstern, you all know from Mosaic, is, is operated by one of our members. And we also operate aircrafts. Our members fund polar research and they handle the logistics. What is also very important is that we collaborate with other international partners. You can see from the other side of the slide. We have MOU with, with few of those and together with these big international partners, we cover basically the whole polar research field. We also work within some of the European funded projects, EU Polarnet and EU Polar Cluster have been mentioned already very extensively, but there are also others. And Important is also our cooperation with the regional bodies, the similar type of organizations that we have, for example, RAPAL in South America and AFOPS in Asia. And in the middle of all this is European Polar Board Secretariat who links the organizations with our members and vice versa. Then what we do in practice and how we, we network and cooperate, we do that via action groups. We have currently four action groups within EPP, and I have added a link to all these action groups to the Arctic Science Ministerial teams to observe, strengthen, understand, and respond. Because I think that all the work that we do in these action groups can be very easily tied to these teams, as well as, of course, all the work that is done individual by our members. 
all these action groups uh, are internal in a way, but they also work in a collaboration with other organizations. We have action group on polar infrastructure, which has produced an infrastructure catalog and infrastructure database, which is available online. And all this work has been done in cooperation with FARO, CONMAP, Eurofleets, Interact, and EU Polarnet. I will have a, a few slides about that as well. Then we have an important uh, action group on international cooperation, which is identifying the practical opportunities to promote effective and mutual valuable international cooperation. It means that they are looking for the, how we can best cooperate with other, or, other organizations in broad way. And a concrete example of the work of this action group is obviously the MOUs we have. Then we have a quite new action group on environmental impacts of polar research and logistics. And this group is working on identifying the potential for sharing the knowledge and expertise between the Arctic and the Antarctic. And also the very important work that this action group is currently doing is a report in a way of best practices and guidelines on how to best minimize the environmental footprint and impacts that researchers are leaving to polar regions. This group is also working very strongly with the other organizations. And then the newest uh, group is a policy advisory group which acts upon the request. So whenever there is a need, for example, from the European Commission or from other national organizations to, to get an information about certain scientific topic or, or important issue related to polar, this action group can act on that. And of course, the strength then of this action group and also the other action groups is within our members and our membership, what we have. So a few slides about the infrastructure database. This is just an, an example on, on how it looks, it looks from the website. We have 32 European Arctic facilities and 31 Antarctic facilities. These are the stations that are also included the online database. The online database is searchable, so you can search uh, based on location, operating country, or the facility type, whether it's a, it's a station, vessel, aircraft, or, or camp, or anything, whether, it's a, it's a all year, it's, whether it is open all year around, or just a seasonal, and so on. And that is foundable from our website. And then the newest part of that is the Due South database, where you can search or create expeditions and, and projects. And this is something that is done in a cooperation with Due South system by Southern Ocean Observation Systems, also available at the EBB website. MOUs were mentioned in connection to the International Cooperation Action Group. We have currently three MOUs, one with the Arctic ECRA, the one with IAS and SCAR was just renewed. We had a signing, a virtual signing uh, during the Arctic Science Summit Week session. And then we have an MOU with the European Space Agency. And, and one of the concrete outcome of that MOU with European Space Agency is the project called Soys Epidemiology. And as already mentioned in the slide where we had a cooperation, we are of course also working in some other European funded projects and EU polar cluster. I will not go more e deeper into this because that will take a lot of time. But what we have also done a lot uh, is organizing different types of webinars and seminars and sessions together with our collaborating partners. And the past year has focused a bit more on COVID-19, obviously, because it has affected a lot to all our members. We have also organized a webinar between uh, EU polar cluster projects where we were looking at the, how the COVID-19 has affected on the polar field work and the responses by all our members. If you are keen on learning more on, on what EBB does, the easiest is to go to the website. You can also follow us in, in social media, either in Twitter or Facebook. You can subscribe to the email list and you can find all the EPP anniversary videos from the YouTube channel as well as all the Arctic Science Ministerial webinars that have been organized. 
that was very shortly and, and quickly what I wanted to, to introduce you because the more extensive talk would have taken a huge amount of time, but I will be happy to answer if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirsi. Uh, we have about 15 minutes to do a quick question and answer, uh, question and answer session. And we've got already got quite a few questions. Um, thank you to all the speakers that have already responded to the questions in the Q&A box. I think there was one question from Vito, uh, which I think is quite important. And I would like to um, put that forward to all the speakers here. And the question was, how should innovation be a part of the themes in ASM3? Because uh, Vito suggests that as we are, um, as the Arctic is experiencing new challenges, they will need to innovate quite, uh, quite a lot to ensure that these challenges are met. So what would the speaker suggest as innovation being part of the themes? I, I can just start a little bit. You know, I definitely think that innovation is where the ASM is pointing to um, and maybe could develop further in the future. Um, you know, what, what we tried to do with this ASM is to really take, you know, the science projects and directions um, that we got through the science process and then let the actions for the joint statement be developed from what was submitted. And I think we're seeing innovation as kind of, you know, what's what's coming up and especially what the ASM can be useful for is starting to identify those gaps and barriers. You know, what what discussions aren't being met or, or where can the community start to point towards? We see innovation, I think, um, not as a specific theme, but really as a cross-cutting um, application that applies to all of the themes. And I think you'll see that it, it is mentioned um, in the joint statement as well as throughout the um, science summary for this ASM. But we, you know, that's a huge identifier for what could maybe develop for ASM4 um, and going forward. And we hope that the ASM community can sort of take some of the themes or actions that were identified in past ASMs and say like, okay, is this still urgent? Or can we sort of put this concept to rest for now and take up a new action? And, you know, maybe that's that's where we're going with um, with innovation, but certainly I think it's it's bubbling to the surface as kind of a key, key area to define. Absolutely, thanks, uh, Lindsay. Is anyone else, would anyone else like to comment on that as well? Um, yes. Nicole? Oh, Anna Maria, go. Uh, yeah, I just want to say a word about this, um, the European Innovation Council, which is a new feature of Horizon Europe. So the decision was to focus more on innovation as um, applied science or taking research results and developing solutions for messy situations. So uh, there will be funding coming on that, but under, so under other... Um, part of the program um, and we have to see how to link what we are doing here with that that part and then what which actors that are active in arctic research are fit and ready to go also into to innovation parts which is a slightly different process than than research thank you uh, just a short comment by me. So if you look at the European Polar Research Program, or um, <clears throat> especially also the white papers we have developed, I can only state what Lindsay said, that innovation is cross-cutting through all the themes. Innovation is also a, a theme which we have to define, of course. Innovation can be on many, many different levels. If we only look at the technological innovation as an example now, uh, which is not the only innovation, then I know that several of the EU polar cluster projects and some of them focusing, uh, some of the new ones, as far as I understand, focus really exclusively on innovation, um, but also many uh, projects develop technologies, discuss new technologies for observations. I should mention a rise here, but I know that Interact is also doing that and so on and so on. So 
uh, even if it's maybe not always specified directly in the text, it is always there. So we are fully aware, at least here in our community, that our, our research also needs to lead to something. Yeah. That's great. Uh, thank you for all the responses. Um, I think I've got one question which might be of interest to everyone. Jerome, please. Yeah, maybe a few words about uh, innovation from, uh, from an ISA perspective. Of course, uh, innovation is, uh, is one of our core of, of activity, especially uh, in the frame of, uh, of new sensors that we are, new mission, new sensor we are developing, especially over the polar region. As uh, maybe most of you know, eh, we are uh, developing the so-called Sentinel expansion mission, which will include the three mission uh, particularly relevant for polar region, uh, CIMER, ROS, L, and CRISTAL. Uh, for example, uh, CRISTAL will, should be the first B-band altimetric mission in KA and KU that will allow for the first time to retrieve uh, snow depth uh, from space. Uh, CIMER will be a high resolution passive uh, microwave mission that will also allow to, to characterize that very high resolution uh, scene CI sickness. So we will have all the sensors, but to do, uh, to really exploit all the sensors, we also need to prepare in advance uh, the ground segment and processing uh, of this kind of data. So that's why uh, we have uh, several RNG projects, especially in the frame of, uh, of the polar cluster. Uh, to develop new methods uh, to generate uh, data product and geophysical variable relevant for polar region. Uh, for example, new way of uh, retrieving uh, snow depth, sea ice sickness, how to combine different missions with different characteristics, different sampling. Uh, so clearly uh, in the frame of, uh, of the polar cluster, it's kind of thing that we are, we are pushing a lot. And uh, within the perspective of the upcoming uh, Sentinel expansion mission, we will try to go even further step uh, beyond what we are doing today with uh, uh, Cryosat and other missions we are operating. Great, thank you so much, Jerome. I think um, there's a question there from uh, Nicholas Fournier, which I think will, the question is actually, uh, I would like to put it to all the panelists, but make it a little bit wider than just for the EPB. Um, Nicholas is suggesting that Nicholas is asking how to better interact with industry partners and how to better get industry partners on board, uh, particularly with relation to data, but I would say all industry partners really. So if the panelists have anything to comment on, that would be great. Nicole, please. Uh, sorry. Um, yes, I have to comment. This is a challenge. Um, I am, I am, I think, so I can, I'm now speaking for the Arise project, which I am a coordinator of, and we have an industry liaison panel, and we are cooperating a lot with the industry in terms of icebreaker operations, demands for um, data, and so on and so on. It is a big challenge to cooperate with the industry. Uh, we are working on different timelines, timelines, and we also on have different, how to say, um, background. I, I, so, let's say science industry relation is different, but I know difficult, but I know that there are a lot of attempts to involve the industry much more. And in Arise, which I gave as an example, after it is now working well. So we are, we are discussing regularly with industry. In EOPOLANET 2, we have the same attempts. We have a full work package dedicated to cooperate with our stakeholders. And industry is certainly one of the important stakeholders we have to deal with when we speak about development in the Arctic. Uh, that's what I wanted to say. So there is a lot of ongoing activities, but it is certainly not an easy job, simply because we are working on so different levels that it is sometimes hard to find um, how to say a good mode of cooperation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to add that there are also big differences between the countries and how, how the funding systems are, are operated. I'm based in Finland where we do have a lot of, lot of cooperation with industry when it comes to the northern uh, uh, different types of things. Um, oil and gas and, and security and all these technologicals and things like that. So it's also a very broad range of ways of doing that and how it functions, yeah. I think that would be great. I think we would love to hear from our ESA partners because I think they've had 
a little bit more of a success in interacting with um, commercial industry partners then and it would be it would be great to hear some lessons uh, that we can follow if you have some pointers that we can follow yeah clearly it's uh, i would say industry is a key player in the space business and uh, what we try to do on either side is to make the link between the user or the scientific community and industry so translating the user need into sensor which is not an easy task uh, because it's two different domains two different vocabulary uh, and especially in the frame of, uh, of the polar uh, Copernicus Sentinel mission, we are developing, we really uh, try to, uh, I would say, to, to, to allow this, uh, this dialogue uh, between industry and end user, uh, because at the end, uh, what we are doing is not uh, only nice sensor, but is useful sensor with useful data for, for the user community. And that's why we need, uh, even in the early uh, phase of development of, of this mission, we need to have uh, feedback from the from the community in order to uh, to design uh, instruments in line with their expectation. So, for example, in the frame of uh, of the Polar Copernicus mission, we will follow closely uh, the Arctic policy, uh, which is clearly our input on which we have based the design and development of the Polar uh, mission. So, clearly, it's a relevant and important uh, tools for us uh, to translate uh, this need uh, into uh, concrete mission and, and data product. And then industry, we have also, uh, I would say more, much more uh, downstream user. Uh, we have also industry using uh, data uh, because it's important for their business. Uh, it's important also for the sustainable management of, uh, of, of some, uh, I would say, of, of polar region and, and potential risk with regard to, uh, to industry. So we have both aspects, uh, both regarding the development of mission, but also uh, regarding the use of uh, all this, uh, this data uh, to support uh, application. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've got a few minutes more and we've got a couple of questions there that we can follow up on uh, before we close the session. So if you've got any further questions, take this chance, please, and type them out in the Q&A box. Uh, the next question is from Jonathan Bamber and uh, Jonathan asks us whether or how can we increase collaboration uh, with not just the within the European partners, but also beyond Europe um, and look to the US, for example, and how do we work with them uh, for ensuring that we are working with all the key Arctic partners? I don't know if Anna Maria wants to take the floor or Nicole or Chrissy. Uh, yeah, I, I can say something. Um, and and then uh, I let Nicole. So I just wanted to say that uh, in the EU Polar Cluster projects, uh, there are international partners other than the EU countries. Uh, and also that I didn't say this during my presentation, but the Horizon Euro program, like Horizon 2020 before, it's open to all the countries. Um, and uh, the Commission has a cooperation agreement with many countries and the US is certainly one of them. Actually, we have cooperation agreements with the three Arctic countries that are not, so Canada, US, uh, the Russian Federation, the countries that are not either a EU country or associated to Horizon Europe, like Iceland and Norway. And uh, another channel um, that we use is the, I mentioned the All Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance. Uh, because there we, we have an agreement, the Galway Statement, it's already since 2013, an agreement with US and Canada to discuss ocean research. And uh, we also, the Arctic is also a topic in there and we, uh, for sure, for sure, it's on the agenda of, of uh, discussion with the, with the United States because it, it's a topic of interest for both parties. Um, thank you. That's all from me. Um, just a short comment to add. So um, we are working in all the international panels and groups. EPB is represented, EOPOLANET is represented, and we are discussing all the initiatives um, with our international partners in in in, Seon, in uh, wherever. So uh, so there are so many ongoing. And so I think we are already now very well networked with uh, the polar community around the world. Um, I just saw Russia. Yeah, Russia is a is 
is an important partner. It's at the moment uh, also a difficult partner uh, due to political constraints, but nevertheless, as German who has a 20 five years long cooperation with Russia, I can say we don't forget them. So we are working with them on all levels and however it is possible. So I think there is a lot to do still. Um, we uh, in EUPolarNet take the, has taken the ball uh, and has a work package on improving these international cooperations also through online tools, webinars and so on. But in fact, I have to say um, that the community is already well networked. Uh, so. Um, via the the IASC and 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 SCA and also we are contributing to all of these panels and discussing uh, it on an international level. Yeah. Great. Um, I have one final question, and it would be great to have maybe just a couple of sentences from all of you. Hearing all of all of these discussions and talks, what would be uh, from your perspective and from the organization's perspective? What would be the theme that you would take forward for ASM4? Now we are talking even beyond ASM3. I think Lindsay slightly gave an introdu introduction to that when she gave her first response, but I think it will be nice to hear a couple of sentences to kind of draw a line under this webinar. Mary Noel, would you like to start? Or Lindsay, I don't know who would like to start. Well, I, I'm not very innovative in this, in my answer. I would say that the four uh, themes that have been uh, outlined, uh, the third ASM is are really important one, all the four of them. And I think that requires much, the, much more than a two year uh, term to be solved. And I think they could probably set the scope for uh, the next one, I would say. Uh, Lindsay, do you want to, uh, Nicole? I fully agree with Marie Noel. I, I, I think that all this, the four themes will be relevant also on the long run. For us as researchers, of course, and I have to stress this, the theme understand is maybe the, those who are, we are looking uh, most at. What I only want to stress is it is urgent. So um, we, uh, we have excellent themes, but the ASM should now really work on implementing or giving recommendations to implement because time is running and we should not lose ourselves in discussions and discussions, but now have to implement also these themes really actively and fast. Yeah, and maybe that's a good um, note to kind of follow up on. I think the the implementation of kind of the high level goals identified through the ASM is, is a big topic of discussion, and it was something that I think Vito was also mentioning in his comment of you know how do we take some of these things into action, um, you know, stressing that this is a ministerial that is a high level meeting. Um, and the implementing, <laughs> you know, comes um, lower down after we sort of get these. Um, you know, sort of signing off on these urgent actions at the high level. Um, so it's it's really up to the foot soldiers to take kind of these high level goals from the ASM and coordinate together through, especially, you know, we have these wonderful examples in Europe of how this coordination can happen um, on really effective levels. And I think there's a lot to share from the European example of, of how all of these agencies work together and coordinate together towards urgent actions. Um, and I will say, you know, just in terms of identifying these urgent actions, the gaps and barriers towards, you know, reaching these goals um, is something that, you know, was particularly thought of by the Science Advisory Board for this ASM3. And we hope that the final um, ASM3 report has some effective tools um, for, you know, thinking about how we kind of take these, um, these next steps. Um, and, you know, now that we have kind of the development of the Arctic Science Funders Forum to work together to coordinate on these urgent actions. Um, you know, we hope we are seeing some some positive develops in the ASM process from sort of the the high level into the implementation level. So that's the hope. Can I add to that something? Because I obviously the all four teams are super important, but I would like to 
focus on strengthen. Also keeping my UATIC hat on my head because I think that the next generation, the youth, the communities, the society is also very important and we should all work on strengthening that. And I would like to highlight that. Jerome and Anna Maria, do you have a mm -hmm. comment? Maybe a very quick point, uh, just, just to say that we, uh, we, we need to continue to, to reinforce uh, cooperation and coordination across the different European entity agency. Uh, and I, I really appreciate uh, the, the cooperation that is done so far, and I think that we can go uh, maybe one step further in the, in the coming year, especially with regard to, uh, to, to the flow of data that will come from the Copernicus program, and I think that we we can also build on, on this in the future to, to better address key challenge over the, the polar region by, uh, yeah, by continuing to, uh, to having dialogue between the different entity and also as previously uh, suggested to, to also involve in a way some uh, partner out of, of Europe into, into this because yeah, polar region is not, uh, it's not Europe, it's not US, it's, it's a global because we all know that uh, the, what is happening there will impact all of us uh, in, a, in a global manner. So that's why cooperation uh, is, a, is a really a, a key word uh, that we need to, yeah, to continue to, to, to foster it. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So as uh, Lindsay said, this is a ministerial, so very high level. I uh, don't want to preempt the next dis discussion. So these are just my own thoughts on this. Uh, I agree with the previous speakers that the themes are to stay. I mean, uh, I do not, uh, the themes now are the global warming and the biodiversity degradation. So I don't think this will, um, will disappear in two years. So for me, it, the themes are these ones. And uh, the new things will be in the iterations will be how to improve our ways to, to tackle this. And maybe looking at social innovation, like how we can now mobilize communities and local communities to, to find solutions to the different issues. And on this, I would also like to add that, of course, we speak on the Arctic, but Arctic is just obviously a part of the Earth system and you cannot speak on one part of the Earth system. I mean, you just need to look at the whole system because it's interdependent. So of course, a lot of what's happening in the Arctic doesn't come from, from, from the Arctic itself. And this um, uh, part I find much more, more challenging in terms of, of actions, because it's a whole global discussion on, I mean, involving the, the whole uh, planet and how our societies function. Of course, with, with some societies being more involved than others. Um, yeah. that's, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, all of you. And I think Anna Maria's comments were a nice way to kind of wrap up the session as well. Um, thank you very much for staying with us. Thank you very much to all the speakers for coming and giving us these um, fantastic talks. And from on behalf of the EPB Secretariat, Joseph, Piotr and myself, I would like to say thank you for attending the webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.